Thanks, Derek. I feel really privileged to uh, be here speaking to all of you and particularly to be speaking after Marianne, um, where, who's been working tirelessly with others of the World Blind Union and other people around the world to make such a monumental shift. Really is a, facet, a, a really important and fundamental shift at the international copyright level. I want to talk a little bit today about the practical implications of uh, the Marrakesh Treaty and the ways in which Australia and other countries can address what has been called the book famine, or the lack of accessibility of uh, uh, books around the world. So particularly, I want to look at first um, a recent case in the US, the Haffey Trust legislation and the role of fair use in digitization and accessibility. And I want to think about the some practical, or well, five practical things that Australia can do right now to increase accessibility for everyone. So this is, as Marianne explains, really a serious problem. Um, less than 20% of the world's books are digitised in an accessible form. It's much worse in developing countries. And it's clear that existing approaches are not working. We've just heard how difficult and complex the current ad hoc model of digitisation and access is in Australia. The statutory licences are slow, cumbersome, expensive. And the practical result of that is that people are not able to access the cultural and knowledge works that they need for full participation in society. So I want to talk about particularly the Google Books um, process, digitization process and the role of the Hathi Trust and other institutional libraries in making books accessible. So the Google Books litigation is a really interesting and important uh, case study in how fair use operates to protect the public interest. And this is something, uh, so we're here almost exactly a year um, after we were gathered here last time. And um, if you remember, if you were here with us last time, the um, ALRC's report recommending that Australia introduce fair use uh, was tabled the day before this meeting. We haven't seen um, much movement on that yet, but I'm still cautiously optimistic that uh, hopefully by the next time that we gather here, uh, we will have seen some major implementations of those recommendations. So the Google Books litigation, it's been a really long process. The, um, there was a recent decision in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in the US that closes off one particular chapter in this process. So Google Books is obviously embarking on a massive digitization project, and they're doing it um, in partnership with institutional libraries and an organization, a foundation called the Haffey Trust. And the goal of this partnership is that um, by granting Google access to these books and overseeing coordinating the scheme, the institutions in the Hathi Trust are able to gain access to accessible, full text and full image versions of all of the digitised books. Now, this is pretty important, but the, um, as some of you may already know, the whole process has been subject to a fairly extensive litigation process. Uh, the most recent of this is the suit by the Authors Guild against Hathi Trust. Um, the Second Circuit decision that we've just seen affirms that these types of preservation and accessibility uses are fundamentally fair uses of copyright material. And this is really important. So in a fair use process, courts go through four factors to examine whether a particular otherwise infringing use is excused from the exclusive rights of copyright owners. The first one of these, um, sorry, not the first factor, but the litigation involved two separate processes engaged in by Hathi Trust. And the first is about um, searching, indexing. So with the full text of the, of the books that were digitized, Hathi Trust is able to provide a full text search interface to those books. Hugely important function, something that's never been done or possible to be done before. The court was really, really clear on this. This is a quintessential transformative use. It is something that doesn't compete at all with the interests of copyright owners, and it is something that should be clearly permissible to be done without having to seek a license from every one of the owners of those books. In the same way that web search engines are, can operate in the US under a fair use provision, 
this index uh, created by Google and Hathi Trust can operate to give access to books. And this is the fundamental problem that we face in Australia, that we have um, very strong copyright exceptions that mirror, sorry, very strong copyright laws that mirror the US without the strong exceptions. Uh, and that means that search engines and projects like this have faced real and serious legal difficulties in Australia. And that's a real problem that we do need to address. The second part of this story is about accessibility. And this is a little bit more interesting to see how a fair use test might work in other jurisdictions. So in the US, as I said, there are four factors. And the court looks first to the type of the use. And in this case, providing access to copyright books is precisely the type of use that copyright owners typically engage in. But importantly, providing accessible copies is not part of what copyright owners typically do. The court recognised that traditionally this is a very underserved market. Copyright owners have not had, publishers, distributors, have not had or have not demonstrated a willingness to serve the needs of people with disabilities. So the court excused this as a fundamental part of the balance in copyright that providing access to people with uh, print disabilities was an important public interest purpose that enables this type of digitization and accessibility to be done even um, though it would traditionally, <coughs> or sorry, even though it would otherwise infringe the rights of copyright owners. Again, the fourth factor, uh, the effect on the market, the court found that there was very little harm here because there was no market for accessible works. The other two factors, there are other two other factors, I could have done the bottom out of order here, uh, because, well, the nature of work factor, the courts have recognised is a pretty limited assistance. The important, there is an important point, a minor point, about the amount and substantiality factor, though. The Authors Guild had a really, um, had an argument that the libraries were copying too much by keeping a backup copy. Uh, and keeping a copy available in another off-site location, or that they were copying too much by copying not only the text and the images. And the, courts were pretty, the court was pretty clear that this type of copying, it did, we don't need to be completely strict about how many copies are produced. What is important is the function to which they're put. OK, so that's enough about the law. What I really want to talk about is how we get things done now. Where do we go from here? And the reality is there is still a very long way to go. Marrakesh is a really important symbolic and pragmatic uh, treaty. Symbolically, it's really important because it shows that the Global South and civil society groups are able to come together at an international level and resist the continued expansion of intellectual property rights and put together and have implemented a treaty that represents the public interest. That is a massive victory at the international level. Pragmatically, as we've just seen, the Marrakesh Agreement sets the groundwork for a more efficient regime to enable books um, digitised and made accessible in one country to be shared with other countries. And that is a really important thing to do to ensure that we don't waste vital resources in digitising works more than once. But there is still, I'm sorry for the formatting of this slide, um, there is still a fairly large way to go in digitisation. And the problem is that digitisation is really expensive. It's an expensive process. And this is why our current approach, which is based on limited ad hoc digitization, doesn't fundamentally work because it's too expensive to do in response to particular needs, which means that only a tiny proportion of works are made accessible to the people that need them. So the implications here for fair use are really interesting because the reason that Hathi Trust was able to gain access to this large corpus of works is that Google is making money off this digitization process. And that is something that worries publishers and authors. 
And it's something we need to be absolutely clear about, that if we don't invest substantial public funds in digitisation, as we've done in Australia and as we should continue to do, but to fix the problem um, with all of the books that are currently published and not accessible, we need, mu we need an injection of much more money. And if it's not going to come from the public sector, it's going to come from the private sector, and they have various private motives to do so. So fair use is important, because fair use is applied not just for happy trust. Fair use applies to organisations like Google, who engage in activities like digitisation that have significant public benefits for private commercial purposes. And we should be upfront about that. And it's something that we should seek to encourage. The innovation in serving new markets, the innovation in providing public interest functions, sometimes it's done by public actors, by institutions like the one we're here now, like the great institutions that we have in Australia, and sometimes it's done by private actors. And that's why it's incredibly important that we remember that fair use is not just a non-commercial activity. It's also important to remember that digitization isn't just done by institutions. We see a lot of work being done by ordinary people on a volunteer basis to make copies accessible. Sometimes this is done in a quite large way. The example here I've got Internet Archive, but uh, Marianne also managed, mentioned Bookshare, for example, that relies on a network of volunteers to digitize, to scan, and proofread the OCR text of books to make them accessible. We don't have uh, this type of flexibility in Australia. So to be clear, I think that there's enough flexibility in clauses like Section 200AB to rely on for institutions to do this type of digitization work. It doesn't allow commercial digitization and accessibility, and it doesn't allow individuals working outside of institutions to embark on these sorts of projects, even to share accessible copies with friends. That is something that fair use would improve. This one's perhaps a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it is time to start talking about copyright duration. There is a fascinating and really important amount of work being done by people uh, working with books that have fallen into the public domain. Project Gutenberg is an excellent example here, uh, that they're able to make books that are out of copyright accessible. And the reality is that we are locked into a copyright term that is manifestly too long. It far exceeds the portion of a book or other copyright works commercial life and locks up a huge amount of knowledge for much longer than is necessary. Unfortunately, we're trapped in this system by a fairly extensive set of international overlapping trade agreements. Uh, but it is time that we start talking about positive change in that way. We need to talk about DRM, the technological protection measures that prevent people from accessing books in certain forms. Um, it's been too long since we have seen the, um, the government's consultation on new exceptions to technological protection measures. Uh, this has been locked up behind some processes for um, and it's at least three or four years overdue. Um, there are significant problems that people are not able to exercise the normal rights that they have as consumers to read works in a way that is accessible to them. So this means being able to remove locks on PDFs and eBooks, for example, that prevent screen readers from operating. It's a fundamentally important right, consumer-based right, that we need to see enshrined in the legislation. At the moment, it's only, again, limited to certain institutional uses. And finally, because I don't want to end on a negative note, I'm actually really optimistic about this one. Yesterday, uh, a bill was introduced into the House that would enable the National Library to seek copies of electronic materials. So it's a legal deposit. And I'm sure most of you have heard about this, obviously. But the really optimistic thing here is that this gives us 
a practical, convenient, low-cost and really effective way to ensure that we fix accessibility problems in the future. As books are made commercially available, published in Australia, online in electronic forms, the National Library can start to collect those electronic forms. And by then, utilising the already existing network of libraries and other institutions, we can ensure that we build a repository of accessible works for anything that is currently available or published in the future. And that is a really <laughs> impressive thing to do that we can do under current law. Well, sorry. But we should soon hopefully be able to do uh, because the legal deposit scheme seems that it will go through. And it's going to take more um, a practical investment and institutional structures and workflows, but it can be a really effective way that we can make sure that the books that we are continuing to publish are not locked up for current and future generations. So that's it from me. Thank you very much uh, to the ADA for having me here, and I'm happy to talk to anyone in further detail over uh, morning tea. Thank you very much.